Well, today's webinar brought to you by Orisher Technologies. Orisher Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. Their unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. Oral based testing products provide simplified collection process, faster results, cost savings, with minimal risk of tampering, and dramatically reduced risk of adulteration. The oral fluid drug test is an FDA cleared laboratory based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for nine drugs of abuse, including marijuana, cocaine, PC, and methamphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, methadone, and opiates. It ranked as the number one recognized brand name in oral fluid testing in a 2014 National Drug Testing Industry Survey. With an easy to administer collection process, Intercept is ideal for workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, and clinical setting screening programs, among others. The session is entitled Lab Based Oral Fluid Testing for Parole, Probation, and Drug Court Programs and will be presented by Bill Curran and Melissa McLean. Bill Curran is the president and current, of Current Consulting Group, a national consulting firm that specializes in drug testing policy, development, and health helping employers optimize their employee screening. The editor of the online Ultimate Guide to State Drug Testing Laws at statedrugtestinglaws.com. He is also the publisher of the e-newsletter State Drug Testing Laws Monthly. Ms. Curran is the former Executive Director of the American Council for Drug Education and served as Vice President of Consulting for a National Third Party Administrator of Drug Testing and Background Screening Services. He is the author or co-author of 10 books on substance abuse issues including Why Drug Testing. He administers the annual drug testing industry survey now in its 17th year, the results of which were presented at the SAPA conference last month. Melissa Lane is Pro-Rector, 9th JDC Rapids Parish Adult Drug Court. Melissa worked for the Rapids Parish Drug Treatment Court for the past 12 years. She began as a bachelor level intern in 2002 and was later hired on as a counselor. In 2008, she obtained a MSW and in March of 2015, Melissa became director for the Rapids Parish Adult Treatment Court, in which has used oral fluid testing since 2011. It will be our pleasure to hear from Bill Curran and Melissa McLean. Who is on today's webinar presentation? Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge Orchard Technologies for hosting and sponsoring today's uh, presentation as part of their monthly series of webinar presentations on drug testing issues. And I want to say something from Jessica's introduction. Actually. Uh, Orsher was ranked the number one recognized brain in oral fluid testing in a 2015 National Drug Testing Industry Survey. Uh, so it is the umpteen year, I think, I think you asked for sure that they've been ranked as the number one recognized brand name in oral fluid testing. And I'm very grateful for uh, their efforts to bring good information to drug testing sellers and buyers uh, to make sure we're educated on the latest trends in drug, drug testing. I'd like to acknowledge my co-presenter, Melissa McLean. I'm looking forward to her comments a little bit later in today's presentation. Now, yeah. to start with, we're going to um, share a little bit of information about the magnitude of the drug problem and its impact directly in the criminal justice um, profession. And then we'll talk about lab-based oral fluid drug testing. I think it's clear to everybody that substance abuse trends in America are definitely heading in the wrong direction. There are any number of studies and surveys that come out every year, most sponsored by the federal government, that indicate that substance abuse uh, is increasing um, all age groups and across a wide variety of demographics. It is definitely being fueled by marijuana and prescription drugs, as I'm going to share with you in a slide or two. People in the justice profession know this firsthand, They're dealing with this problem every day when it comes to prisoners, parolees, people who are going through drug courts, etc. And so it really behooves those in the, in the criminal justice profession to know the latest trends in drug abuse, but then also the testing methods that are available today to help combat the problem. Uh, obviously, if you 
you do drug testing, you know that drug test cheating is a big problem. And that's the benefit, or one of the benefits, I should say, of based oral fluid testing. Sometimes it's not even a matter of one or the other, but it's a matter of merging or combining different testing methods, urine testing and oral fluid testing, to sort of get the best of both worlds. And that's something that many of the criminal justice professions are doing. And some employers who are doing workplace drug testing are just sort of catching on to over the last couple of years. So we're going to talk about the magnitude of the problem and then launch into some information specifically about um, lab-based oral fluid testing. The federal government comes out with a study every year called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and it estimates by way of surveying individuals the levels of substance abuse in all kinds of different categories uh, among different age groups, employment, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really fascinating because this, this data goes back to the 1970s, so it's the only thing that we have in America from a year to standpoint that shows us trends in substance abuse. And the 2013 survey, which is the latest, that's the 2013 information based on, that came out later, but it was based on surveys done in 2013. 25 million Americans, 12 and older, admitted as part of that survey to being a current illicit drug user. That means a current illicit drug user is defined as somebody who admits to using an illicit drug at least once in 30 days prior to participating in the survey. I mean they only used it once, but they admit that they used it at least once in the 30 days prior to being surveyed. That's almost one and a half percent of the population 12 and older. 22 and a half million current illicit drug users aged 12, 18 and older, 60.9%, about 69% employed either full or part-time. And among adults 18 and older who were unemployed, 18.2% were current drug users. These are important information, uh, important data if you're in the pr criminal justice profession because these you're dealing with people who are struggling to find work or who are currently unemployed. And I'll show you some some um, occupations here in a moment that come from the same study uh, show where the levels of alcohol abuse and drug abuse are, are most prevalent in terms of occupations. But this is important data, obviously. Now, when you pair the different types of drug abuse, marijuana is by far the number one substance of abuse after alcohol. If we're just talking about illicit drugs or the use of drugs, marijuana is by far number one, 19.8 million, followed by the whole family of prescription drugs. We're talking about sedatives, tranquilizers, uh, antidepressants, etc. The hydrocodones and the hydromorphones, the oxycodones and the oxycodones morphones. A whole family of prescription drug, drugs together make up the number two category of illicit drug abuse in the United States. It's 5 million. And then you see the drop off to cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, heroin. And I will say, and of course, people, uh, for, uh, criminal justice professionals know that heroin is definitely making a, a, a certain comeback in some parts of the United States. And so we would expect to see that number there you see at the bottom of the chart being higher in the 2014 numbers that will come out this year in 2015. But this is how you would sort of look at that. And of course, if and there there was just an article that came out yesterday that showed that the levels of marijuana use, and this is of course predictable, right? In Oregon, a state that has legalized marijuana uh, for, for any purpose, not just medicinal, but for quote unquote recreational use, that marijuana use has increased significantly as drug addiction. In Oregon, and of course, marijuana is legal in Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Colorado. It's also le legal in the District of Columbia, but it's a little bit of a different situation. Just to take an aside there, in the states that I mentioned, uh, marijuana is legal, and there's a legal marketplace for marijuana in or Washington, Alaska, and Colorado. In Washington D.C., it's illegal to sell marijuana. Not legal to use it. Uh, but it's still Ill, but it's illegal to sell it to market it, and so they did create a legal marketplace for marijuana in, in D.C. It's a little bit different than places, but we expect to see an increase in marijuana abuse in those states, in the district as well as in the other states that I mentioned. Specifically, I've got some slides coming up specifically on criminal justice, and and I read that many in in the in the criminal justice profession know this, but let's just review some of these things to sort of get us all on the same page as we launch into a discussion about lab-based 
for the drug testing. Some of this is a little bit old, but it's the most current stuff that we have in 2004. 17% of state prisoners and 18% of federal inmates said they committed their current offense, the offense for which they were incarcerated, to obtain for drugs. And then in the National Crime Victimization Survey, in 2007, there were 5.2 million violent victimizations of residents aged 12 or older, and the victim violence were asked to describe whether they perceived the offender to have been drinking or using drugs. So in other words, as part of that report, it's a survey to ask the perception of the victim of the person who assaulted them. About 26% of the victims of violence reported that the offender was using drugs or alcohol. That's the perception of the person who was assaulted. Between 1995 and 2000, 41% of violent crimes committed against college students and 50% of non-students were committed by offender perceived to be using drugs. And two in five of all rape and sexual assaults, and about a of all robberies against college students committed by an offender also to per, uh, perceived to have been using drugs. It's the workplace, workplace violence. 35% of the victims of workplace violence believe that their offender was drinking or using drugs at the time of the incident. And 7% in, well, if you break down by uh, perceptions by the occupation, percent in law enforcement perceived the offender to be using alcohol or drugs, 35% in the medical professions, and 31% in retail sales. Now, switching gears just slightly to alcohol abuse. As I mentioned earlier, marijuana is the number one illicit drug of abuse in a country. Alcohol is the number one drug of abuse uh, by far, slightly more than half. 52.1% of Americans 12 and older reported being current drinkers of alcohol. Now, let me explain a little bit similar to the uh, definition of a current illicit drug user. This is someone who admits to drinking uh, or having a drink at least once in the 30 days prior to being surveyed. So, you know, a lot of things, and it doesn't necessarily mean somebody was impaired, right? Go down to the second bullet. Nearly one quarter, 23% of persons age 12 or older, in a 2012 report were binge alcohol drinkers. They admitted to being binge alcohol drinkers. It means that they admitted to having at least five drinks on one occasion in the 30 days prior to the, to the survey. That's about nearly 60 million people. The third bullet. In 2012, the same year, heavy drinking was reported by 6.5% of those 12 and older, or about 17 million people. Those people who admit to having at least five drinks on at least five occasions in the phase just prior to participating in the in the list of occupations. So remember, alcohol abuse is admitted having at least five drinks on at least five occasions in the 30 days prior to participating in the survey. And keep in also in mind that the percent of people who abuse alcohol and other drugs such as marijuana is also a very significant factor. If you look at the professions here, you see at the top, electricians, carpenters come down a little, little bit. You see construction laborers, other construction-related workers, workers, servers come down a little bit to cooks, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, some are skilled positions, but most of them really aren't. The percentage of heavy alcohol use in these different occupational categories is fairly significant. When I put this on here on a webinar presentation to criminal criminal justice professionals, well, obviously, you're dealing with people who are either required to get a job or who are being held accountable to try to find a job, et cetera. And these are a lot of the types of professions that, that they could probably find a job in, retail, food and beverage servers, uh, general construction or construction-related workers, et cetera. And you can see by these percentages that alcohol abuse, and there's a corresponding to that almost matches exactly with this list in this order, not exactly. Um, for use, you can see the percentages are pretty high. So a lot of people that you're working with, that you're trying to help, you know, sort of take a, uh, some accountability in their lives and maybe find employment, etc., are looking for jobs in professions where there's a fairly high rate of substance abuse already in the profession. And so they're trying to act together, hopefully in many cases, and they're putting themselves in positions where they're surrounded by substance abuse. Again, I'll use for a few slides here. Five million adults 
So that's 36% of those under correctional supervision at the time were drinking at the time of their conviction offense. Of drinking, we know it leads to criminal behavior. There are a number of studies on there. You see what you uh, what these two bullets here. Look at the second bullet. Though federal research shows that uh, for the 40% of convicted murders being held either in jail or state prison, alcohol use was a factor in the homicide. So we know that the substance abuse levels are fairly high. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, uh, just so that we can get to the main topic of today's webinar presentation. Also, I'd like to point out that you're going to get an email from Jessica. Uh, probably later today or early tomorrow with the information on how to access the recording of today's presentation as well as these slides. So hope you're not furiously taking notes. Uh, you can, of course, if you'd like, but you're going to get these slides with all of this data and information in there with all of the sources, etc. A lot of good information that may be helpful to you um, as you administer uh, drug and alcohol testing within your organizations. But there's definitely a connection between alcohol abuse and crime and drug abuse and crime as well. I just wanted the third bullet. Seventy percent of alcohol-related incidents of violence occur in the home with the greatest frequency at 11 p.m. Twenty percent of these incidents involve the use of a weapon other than hands, fists, or feet. And then just to make the connection, because I want to I want to make a point here, to drive while well under the influence, um, driving while well intoxicated, nearly 13 thousand people every year in the United States in alcohol-related accidents over the road. Hundreds of thousands of others are injured. It ends up costing literally billions of dollars to taxpayers to cover the cost of these types of accidents and the treatment that's needed uh, as a result of. Near 0.4 million people are arrested for DWI each year. Only 80,000 are actually convicted. And those who are convicted, one third are sentenced to community corrections. So 180,000 convicted, 1.4 million, a little over, they're about half percent, a little under 50 percent. A third are actually sentenced to community corrections, and two thirds of those sentenced to incarceration are actually repeat offenders who were in this position before and now they're back again. I want to make the point, here, though, that, that study came out earlier this year that showed that traffic fatalities. Uh, related to alcohol abuse over the last 10 years has pretty much remained steady. Al but fatalities related to, to under the influence of marijuana have tripled in the last 10 years. And the that was done was for five of which have legalized mar marijuana. So for those who claim that marijuana legalization is not to have any negative impact on society, that more people won't be using marijuana, et cetera, et cetera, and you find these arguments on their web websites. The reality is that it's already having a negative impact on society, and it's going to translate into an, uh, more work within the criminal justice profession uh, dealing with the people who are driving under the influence of marijuana. And some more statistics here. I don't want to belabor the point. Um, you're going to get all these stats. Let's let's move on now to uh, the whole question about drug testing. Many of the people on today's webinar are very versed in drug testing. You deal with it virtually every day. You know what the challenges are. But it's important to know, and there are a number of studies that bear this out, that drug testing has proved to be a very powerful weapon in the war against drugs. For some, the deterrent that they need to not use drugs uh, or in the case of alcohol testing, to misuse alcohol. But it's, it's proven to be an effective way to identify people who need help. And sometimes under certain circumstances, that drug, drug test will end up saving somebody's life, saving somebody's marriage, saving somebody's family. There's no, no debate or question about that. It doesn't work for everybody, obviously. But it's proven to be an effective way to hold people accountable and in some cases get people the help that they need. Now, there are different ways to do drug testing. Uh, the traditional way is a based urine test where you collect a urine sample, you send it off to a laboratory, and you get a result back a day or two later. Uh, there are challenges, obviously, that go along with that traditional method of drug testing. Um, and for that reason, there are many who have looked at alternatives, like hair testing, for example. 
example, and like oral fluid testing. So in other words, testing something other than a urine sample. With testing, there are a lot of myths still out there that people will repeat back to me when I speak at conferences and whatnot, and they'll say, well, I, I was under the impression that marijuana can't detect or that marijuana can't be detected in an oral fluid drug test, or that marijuana is not legal in my state or in my profession, or oral fluid testing is just as susceptible to cheating as urine testing is. Some of these are sort of seem to be self-perpetuating. I'm going to go through each one of these and talk in detail, showing studies that sort of refute these myths. But as I go through there, go through the, the several slides, keep in mind that what for one group or one organization may not be perfect for organization. It depends on what your situation is and the practical application of these different testing methods. As I mentioned, sometimes it's not a question of which test method is the best, but which is best for you in your organization under the circumstances that you conduct drug testing. And possibly, as Melissa would probably bear, uh, uh, tell you, sometimes it's there of combining different testing methods in a single program to get the, the best of both uh, worlds. And so we'll talk about that as we go a little bit further. Let's talk about the accuracy of oral fluid testing first. And let me point out that as I go through this, I'm basically talking about lab-based oral fluid testing, collecting an oral fluid sample and send it to a laboratory for analysis, just like you would with a urine sample. There's a significant difference in the technology and, to some extent, accuracy of a lab-based urine test and an instant result urine test. There's a much bigger difference between the accuracy in a lab-based oral fluid test versus an instant result oral fluid test. Not to say that instant result oral fluid testing is bad wrong. You just know what you're getting and whether that's going to meet your needs. The technologies behind lab-based oral fluid testing, and, and I'm going to say based a lot, but I want that distinction so it's clear to the audience that we're talking about lab-based and not instant or point of care or oral fluid testing, uh, unless I say specifically. But the drug in oral fluid is related to the amount of drug in the bloodstream at the point or the time where you collect that oral fluid sample. Fluid mimics blood, so uh, you know the 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 scientists in the field of drug testing will typically tell you that blood is the gold standard, the most accurate method of, of, of drug testing, and that's it's just not very practical. It's very expensive. It's not even legal in the workplace drug testing market in many states for workplace drug testing purposes, except in limited situations. But fluid mimics blood. So it's very similar. It operates, the technology works the same um, in some ways with blood. It's some to it as a blood, or rendering a blood equivalent result. Oral fluid tests for the parent drug and not metabolite. When testing a urine sample, you're detecting the metabolite of the drug. The with oral fluid testing, with based oral fluid testing, you're able to detect the metabolite, of course. But also, in fact, you're able to detect the parent drug itself, the drug, and not the metabolic breakdown of the drug. And this makes it possible to detect drug use almost immediately after the drug use occurs, whereas it takes time for the body to metabolize the drug and for the metabolite to be detectable in a urine sample. So there have been advances, of course, in all different testing methods, but in oral fluid testing and the collection technology, so that we can be a little bit more accurate in how we present the results. Let me show you an example. Um, let me, I'm going to go back to this slide. Let me come to the window of detection, because this is, this is the point I was trying to get, so I've jumped ahead a little bit. And the, the blue and the red lines represent oral fluid testing and blood testing, respectively. The yes urine, the brown is hair. The open window detection is represented on the far left of the chart. You can see with oral fluid in urine, the window of detection, or excuse me, with oral fluid in blood, the window of detection is right there within it after ingestion of the drug takes place, after the individual has used drugs. Whereas with urine, you're going 
Christmas Eve, there's a little bit of a lag time before drug use will be detected or detectable in that urine sample. And then with hair, of course, just as, as a point of comparison, the window of detection doesn't open up for a period of days after the individual has used the drugs. But as you notice to the far right of the chart there, the window of detection stays open a lot longer with hair. It's about a 90-day window of detection. But typically what you're going to find in most testing methods, blood, oral fluid, and urine, and oral fluid and urine being the most common, you're going to see that the window of detection at the beginning is either immediately after the individual uses drugs, as in the case of oral fluid, or within about an hour or so when it comes to urine. On the other side of the window of detection with oral fluid and urine, you're going to see that the oral fluid window of detection closes sooner than with, with urine testing. Did I say that right? The oral fluid window of detection will last just a little shorter time than with urine. Now let me go back a slide. So the drug, tr the drug comes into the individual system and it transfers to oral fluid from blood. And so drug oral fluid from blood occurs as long as drugs are in the bloodstream. Thus the detection times, I'm just reading the underlying portion here, start with minutes of ingestion and continues for as long as the drug remains in the bloodstream. The window of detection is affected by lots of different factors. And a drug, whether we're talking about marijuana or cocaine, et cetera, has its own unique window of detection as each specimen as well. So that's why when you look at this chart, this is a generalization. It's a good generalization, but you might see a shorter window of detection for marijuana versus cocaine versus opiates, et cetera. It just depends on the drug and, and the type of specimen that you're using. again, and I apologize as I went forward a little bit here, when, but this all comes to the, the question or the issue of accuracy. So looking at the different testing devices and products that are on the market, you look for a product that has empirical data, independent empirical data from peer journals, for example, to back any accuracy claims. Because I keep about the window of detection and what it's like for urine versus oral fluid, lab versus instant, uh, for marijuana versus cocaine. But you have to deal with a provider who can provide information in some type of independent empirical data publication. You're going to have clearances and specifications that back up that device. For example, with fluids, you're, you're collecting the sample and sending the device that you're putting the sample into inventory, not on like with urine, the, the process anyway, it's very similar. You're collecting it in a collection device and sending the device to a laboratory. You're sure that that collection device is a cleared and that the assays at the laboratory are also FDA cleared. So, so deal with a collection device or with a drug testing system in the laboratory that doesn't have the backing of the Food and Drug Administration. It's not you want something that's FDA clear. That gives you the assurance that the product you're dealing with can perform in the ways that the, the manufacturers or the providers claim that they can. And then product to the test. You know, ask for for a sample, and then your own pilot study. That's where you're going to really find out if it works for you. Remember, talk about a lot of things when it comes to choosing a drug testing program, but the actual real-world application, which is what Melissa is going to talk about here in a minute, in your setting is really what matters, right? Once you identify a good product that is really accurate and there's empirical data to, uh, to support that you're dealing with an FDA-cleared device, then you'll be able to put it to the test and make sure that it's going to work for you. And the only way to do that is to, to get sample and give it a try, okay? I'm the long way to to get to that point, but now we're the whole issue of positive drug test results, and that's sort of the bottom line when it comes to drug testing. How does oral fluid testing compare to urine testing? Remember, I talked about the window of detection opening up sooner on the on the front end of the window with oral fluid, but then closing sooner with oral fluid on the back end. Well, with urine, the window of detection takes a little bit to open up on the front end, but it's going to stay open a little bit longer on the back. And so you you wonder you're you're 
getting the types of the, the window of detection that's going to get you the positive drug test results that you expect to see from the audience that you're dealing with. Okay. So in the small print at the bottom, this is a study that shows the results uh, from millions of drug tests that were done, in this case with the Orsher intercept device, but speaking only of lab-based oral fluid testing. So the middle column that says intercept, think of that as lab-based oral fluid testing compared to lab-based urine testing. The all positivity rates comparing literally millions of samples was 0.1% positivity for lab-based oral fluid testing, in this case the intercept device, and 4.4% overall for urine testing. But now I'm down to the four drug listed there. That's THC, right? That's the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. What was the positivity rate under lab-based oral fluid testing? 2.5%. For urine testing, 2.3%. So actually, the positivity rate for lab-based oral fluid testing for the number one drug of abuse, which is was actually a bit higher with lab-based oral fluid testing was with lab urine testing. In fact, the big difference between the two, as you can see, is under amphetamine, that top drug listed there, which it was 0.42 compared to 0.17. And then in all the other categories, the positivity rate for lab-based oral fluid testing was higher. So not to say it's more accurate than urine testing. Lab-based urine testing is an accurate medium for testing. But, but what we're the point making here is that the positivity rate with lab-based oral fluid testing is very similar. You're going to find a, a very similar type of accuracy, but but it comes down to the product that you're using, the testing system that you're using. That's why I underscore the importance of identifying a testing system that is FDA cleared. Not just the device, but the test process in the laboratory, the, the actual assays or drugs that you're going to test for. And that's why you want to deal with with a, a product at all possible where the number of assays have been approved, not just three or four, but in the case of uh, what we read at the very beginning, nine or ten assays approved. And now we've really sort of talked about the marijuana issue a little bit ahead of time, but the, the key point here, if you're comparing different testing products, is to look at the cutoff levels that are used and the method. If you're to lab based oral fluid testing versus POCT, which is point of care or the instant result, the disposable instant result of devices, cutoff levels are very, very different, especially when it comes to THC. With, with the instant result devices for oral fluid testing, which work wonderfully at the cutoff levels that they use, they are much higher than with lab-based oral fluid testing. Lab-based oral fluid testing is going to be similar to lab-based urine testing in terms of the types of cutoff levels, even though they're speaking in two sort of different languages. Um, with POT oral fluid, you're, you're better to, to accurately detect THC. You've got to be able to, to you're going to find that the cutoff levels are much higher. Okay? And so that affects, of course, the window of detection and things of that nature. So look at this, this diagram here. The blue bars represent positivity rates at, as you go across the bottom horizontally, different cutoff levels. Less than 5 nanograms per milliliter, less than 20 nanograms, 35, and then the all-important cutoff of 50 nanograms per milliliter. Look where the majority of the positives are. They're both 50 nanograms per milliliter. That's that little red dotted line there. The point here is that if you're looking at a device with a cutoff level of 40 or 50 or above 50 nanograms per milliliter, as you can see to the right of that dotted red line, you're going to see very few positives because the majority of the positives for THC are above 50 nanograms. And if you want to take it a, a further, if I could do it, I would move that red dotted line to the left and I'd bring it all the way over to 20 nanograms per milliliter because that's where you're going to see the vast majority of positives. They're going to be captured in that range, less than, five, tw less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. And that's why the federal government recently came out with uh, proposed guidelines for lab-based oral fluid testing for, for federal places. Okay, to be clear, it's for the testing of federal employees. It will be beyond that, of course. It doesn't necessarily apply to, the, apply to the criminal justice market, but it's important to know the criteria that was used by the federal government in establishing these guidelines. And one of the uh, criteria was 
cut level of 4 nanograms per milliliter for that initial screen. So in one example, you see at least the government in terms of trying to justify adding laboratory fluid testing to the testing methods which they, which they will accept, and in this case right now it's only lab-based urine testing, they determined that that 4 nanograms per milliliter was the right cutoff level to have. Now, there are a lot of comments submitted uh, where people were suggesting maybe 3 nanograms per milliliter, some a little, a little bit than 4, most low, at 4 or lower. The point, that's where the majority of the positives take place. That's where you're going to find them. And so you're and looking at products and devices that you're carrying using. Keep in mind that the technology between lab-based and instant oral fluid testing is very different. And that when it comes to cutoff levels, you you could be using a product that can detect use THC, the number one drug of abuse, at levels that it's going to be detectable, where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, and that's going to be at that lower range. So if you're looking at a product with a with a cutoff level of 50 nanograms or higher, you're going to get a lot of positives. It's just the there are, you know the the share shows that absolutely to be the case, but you'd find that in a number of different studies that are available. It affects a lot of different things. If you're dealing with oral fluid versus urine, you're talking about a completely different drug testing situation that a client is going to walk into uh, and and possibly be, be prepared for. And one of the big issues with urine testing is drug test cheating. There are just so many different ways to test on a urine drug test. It doesn't it's a bad test, testing method, but if adulteration, switching, or cheating, all the different ways that they can cheat with urine testing, if that's a concern or issue where you conduct drug testing, then look at alternatives. And it's very difficult to cheat on a hair test, but you've got that, that window of action that may not be suitable in the criminal justice arena. And then almost impossible to cheat with an oral fluid test, yet again, a different wind detection, a different, you know, scenario altogether when it comes to oral fluid testing. And it's very, very difficult to cheat when it comes to oral fluid testing. In fact, I did some research on the Internet. If you on there beat the drug test, if you type it in, do a Google search, you're going to really get over a million possible websites that you can visit. I've done it. I pulled one of them this advice. If you're going to go in for an oral fluid drug test, the advice is avoid the test. Don't give your saliva. As the book says, between these periods of time, you must avoid being screened or you will surely test positive because there's virtually no proven, reliable way to cheat on an oral fluid test. And part of the reason for that is because literally every test is observable. Every collection is observable. You're not sending somebody into a, a, into a bathroom stall where they can privately, you know, within the confines of that stall, Start cheat on on the on the avoiding of their sample. A number of other issues, but if drug test is an issue where you work, then it may be something that you want to look at in terms of your drug testing program. You may want to look at oral fluid testing. So that's a lot of information. I realize that, and I said at the very beginning, what's the what's the most important factor? The application of this testing method will work for you and your organization in the in which you conduct drug testing. And that's the bottom line. It can be the best testing method in the world, but it's got to work for you. And so I'm very, very pleased now to bring in my co-presenter, Melissa McClain, who actually administered the drug testing program in the justice field, has a real-life experience dealing with different testing methods. And so I'm going to hand the virtual microphone over to Melissa to share with us a little bit about her experience with drug testing in the criminal justice field, in particular, where her organization decided to add oral fluid testing to its program. So, I'll turn the microphone over to you. And uh, thanks for having me on this um, webinar to kind of talk to people who are actually working with the client day to day. I believe that in, in drug court, period. Um, we should always have a training device test. We should have a number of things that we can utilize to um, 
draining our clients, not just, you know, rely on one thing. Um, because in drug courts, we know that the response time is very, very essential. And so the quicker we can detect um, if substance being used, then the more effective we will be intervening. It's mainly why we decided to do both and, and um, oral fluid testing. All of your testing mechanisms simultaneously is a a big, big deal. You need it to determine if you're getting continued sobriety or if there is an episode of use so that you have an accurate account of that. Some examples of be used um, more so than a urine screen. If you're a drug court, then everybody has a status day. We call it status or a court reporting day where status where clients come to court. That's a high chance that they may use a substance. Um, the most highly used will be alcohol. Um, or status day. They may not have to test that day. But they use hours before. Oral tests can be used to detect that. So to determine if that client, you know, is continuing their sobriety or if they've had a use an episode. And the way that you can use it is the day after a client test. Of course, we do have randomized testing. At times they're tested back to back, at times not. But if a client has been tested, they have the thought that they will not be tested the next day. Test for you one day and you said same day. So you can use a neural test to determine one again. As you see if you know the client is continuing their sobriety or is having to use an episode or a relapse. Um we have you um, on, on many occasions, um, gym specific, do mostly in house testing, means that the testing is done by staff, both men and female. Well, test, it does not have to be gender specific, so a client appears to be intoxicated while in group, we would need to have a done. Supervised, we can use our list for instances like that. Oh, um, if there are times when staff may, everybody on staff, just about besides the clerical staff, I'd be available because we do have conferences that everyone has to attend, trainings that everyone has to attend. And it's like that, I want to encourage you to have the whole team trained on oral fluids. The training is very user friendly. And it's asking the question Have you eaten any or drank anything in 10 minutes? If the person says yes or no, like we're trained, still let them wait 10 minutes before you do the test. May the client handle the, the device. You're just giving the instructions. I had my clerical team when all of our team members were out. They performed the testing. I'm trained as well. One thing Bill said is a ongoing battle for us to determine adulteration and tests for urine. Um, and they want to bring in urine. They want to adulterate their own tests. Um, that that is an issue, and that is where oral testing is also needed. Like I said in the beginning, um, if it's testing, urine um, testing, um, sweat patch, hair testing, I just um, think that have a Testing device trunk or test of where um, you would be using many things. I would not just depend on um, one device um, 
for your, your client. I will always have a, at least a similar one on hand. Bang. Theo? That's excellent, Melissa. I've got a couple of questions for you. So you talked about sort of uh, at the, at the, towards the end there, you talked about the ongoing battle uh, over adulteration. And obviously, you know, you, you've been dealing with this for a while. Do you ever have clients seem surprised when they find out that you do an oral fluid test instead of a urine test? Surprise. Whenever we um, use us and advice with the oral testing, they are always surprised about it. Um, they have so many questions. Well, what is the test for and everything like that. So, yes, they are surprised. Because we most of the time we do urine testing, but there are times and um testing could be more accurate than our urine test. So there they what are what are some of the obvious ways that you've seen people try to cheat on a urine test? Yeah, um we will dilute their specimen. I will attempt to bring um Clean urine in or synthetic urine in. Um, that's the example that I have. So, in order to do that, to to smuggle in some clean urine or synthetic urine, I mean that takes some some forethought on their part. They've got to figure out how to hide it on their on their body and bring it in, etc. And so, if you then spring an oral fluid test on them. Um, could literally, I mean, it's possible, I suppose, you tell me, they could literally have fake urine on their person and use it because you're not collecting their urine, you're collecting their oral fluid. Have you ever sensed that happening or something like that? Um, if they have detection or have um, words, so to speak, that they may be bringing in urine, then we definitely have in the past switched up and oral test to them when they were expecting to submit to urine test. Okay. Yeah, okay. Spent, um, oh, go ahead, please. I um, mentioned as well when um, we have what we call a stall where clients um, are asked to come in and submit to a urine test, but they for some reason cannot submit to one, um, and we definitely incorporate the oral test. And uh, we, like I said, we prep the testing here by staff. And we have that testing during particular hours of the day. So when clients um, miss that time period for whatever reason, whether it's on purpose or they can um, make them or what have you, then we offer them the oral test because at least they, we are getting a, getting a test from them that day. Okay. One of the uh, things I was going to mention on the next slide, I'll just bring it up because I wanted to ask you a question about this, um, some advantages of oral fluid testing. But if you look at the, the final bullet there at the bottom, easy to administer, often preferred by those who administer tests. And I suppose in, in, the, in your case, with your staff, obviously you've got, you know, professionals who are, you know, it's part of their job. But you also mentioned that you've had your clerical staff trained as well. Are they trained just in the administration of the oral fluid collection, or do you also have them trained to observe or to administer urine collections? Well, we have them um, trained to do urine collections as well. Um, however, as a female clerical staff, so um, they cannot supervise the male testing. So we don't have any, when our staff is away, then they can utilize the oral test for both men and women. So everybody can be tested even okay. when we are alive. Uh, and uh, I don't even know the, the answer to this question, but I would imagine that in, under some circumstances, if you're dealing with staff who don't routinely administer the test, they may be uncomfortable, you know, with a urine collection uh, under some circumstances, I would imagine. And, um, then, because the clinical staff, they because they are trained, they will train to do the urine specimens, but they are more comfortable with the oral. Okay. <laughs> Just one last question. You t 
talked about um, at the very, very beginning of your, your portion, you talked about response time and how important that is. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the response time as far as with um, drug courts, we have to respond as immediately as, as, immediate as possible to intervene if I had some type of infraction. As it relates to, um, to drug training, the sooner that we can detect that they're using, the better. So sometimes we use urine tests to determine that. Sometimes we can use the oral test to determine that. But like I said at the beginning, that it's better to not just rely on one screening device. That as many as you can have is better. Okay. Well, it's another question then I just, you know, sort of related, which is have you, obviously you must be happy with oral flow testing, but have you noticed any significant difference in the positivity rates with one testing method versus the other, or are they very similar? Well, we have had positives with the oral for marijuana and opiates. Have had any positives for the other substances on opiate tests, I mean on oral tests. Of course, you do get positives, and yeah. then, and then what do you based on the positive? I mean, does the client ever want to contest the result if they find out it's not urine? Always, um, we always give them the privilege of having a confirmation, but we have not had that situation with our oral test. Okay. Any situations in the profession you're in? When people test positive, they they they're ready. They're going to test positive. I imagine. Pretty. <laughs> yeah. Anything that you want to add before we close today, Melissa? Um, no, just um for um the best participating in the webinar, I want to encourage you if you're using your devices only to um. The option of just have to, having other testing devices um, in your inventory so that, um, you know, you can, especially if you work for a drug court, because whatever helps you to meet the response time and intervene uh, for that's continuing to use or that has relapsed is important. Now, are you using, what method of testing do you use for alcohol testing? Why were you using um, urine test for that? Okay. The questions that we got from our audience was, um, what is the window of detection for alcohol? Um, just that, that's, that's how they worded the question, and is it too short for oral fluid testing? Have you done any comparisons uh, between oral fluid and urine when it comes to alcohol te testing? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, just really speaking to our audience member who submitted this question, the window of detection with for alcohol testing in general is, you know, a very short window of detection. We're talking about a matter of hours, depending on uh, the, the number of factors, the amount of alcohol in the individual system, and of that nature. But, but uh, generally speaking, uh, oral fluid testing, like a like an instant oral fluid device like the QE device, which I'm sure some people in the audience today use, um, versus an evidentiary breath test or even a non-evidentiary breath test are going to produce accurate results in terms of detecting alcohol within somebody's system uh, above a, a designated cutoff level. Uh, but generally speaking, the window of detection is you know, just a period of hours, um, and it depends on a number of different factors. Uh, let me just close uh, by, one, thanking Melissa for her wonderful remarks and her real-world perspective on all of this. And I think it's important because a lot of everything Melissa was talking about sort of underscores what I said from the beginning, which it's not, not usually a question of which testing method is the best one, but which one is best for you. And you may find in a number of different circumstances that the combination of, say, urine and oral fluid testing all together uh, provides your organization 
uh, with uh, everything that you need to be able to uh, enter a very accurate and timely drug testing program. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, a, either or, but even a, a possibly a combination. And we do a lot with uh, employers who are administering drug testing programs, and we're finding with greater uh, frequency, uh, employers are now switching to programs that combine oral fluid with urine testing or oral fluid with hair testing. They want that um, ability to detect immediate use of drugs that you get with oral fluid, uh, along with maybe the longer window of detection to uh, detect lifestyle uh, issues with a job applicant, for example. So sometimes it's a matter of uh, combining different testing methods uh, to get a little bit of the, the best of each testing method or what each testing method has to offer. So, Alyssa, thank you very much. I'd also like to once again thank Orsher Technologies for um, hosting today's webinar. We will have a, another Orsher webinar on November 17th on the subject of marijuana and the legalization of marijuana. Everyone who is on today's webinar will receive an invitation to that webinar just in case you're interested. Um, and that will be at 2 p.m. Eastern time on November 17th. That's uh, the November uh, webinar hosted by Orsher Technologies. Thank you again for participating, and now hold on for Jessica, who will explain uh, how you're, you can access today's uh, recording and slides. Thank you, Bill and Melissa. And on behalf of Orisher Technologies, we hope that you have found today's presentation important and helpful. If you ask a question, we answer your question via email. And if you have any other questions, you may submit them to info at consultinggroup.com. The presentation was recorded, and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Thank you for your attendance today. This concludes today's webinar.